Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Vlastimil and I work for the SUSE uh, in the labs department in one of the kernel teams and in upstream memory management kernel community. Uh, we just had the, the LSFMM conference earlier this week in this center and some of the things I will be saying will just report on the outcome of the discussions we had there. So I'm going to be talking about the slab allocators in the kernel because a few years ago I became one of the maintainers of, of, the, of this subsystem and also handle the git tree and the best way to maintain something is to reduce the size of it to make it more maintainable. So that's my current project you'll be hearing about. So just to get everyone on the same slab page, uh, what are the kernel slab allocators? Th these, are, these are equivalent of what you have in libc for like the malloc free calls. If you want to allocate something small, like a string or, or a C structure, and you either know the size in advance or you are given it by somebody else. And uh, so the aim is these smaller objects that are smaller than a page, which is usually for kilobytes. Of course, the API supports even larger uh, sizes than that, but then it just offloads them to the page allocator because that's more effective. Uh, so that's kmalloc and k3. The, uh, the direct equivalent of the malloc and free. Then uh, it turns out that many uh, many objects are uh, allocated in large number, but they are the same kinds of objects like uh, network sockets or VMAs or dentries, inodes. And it makes sense uh, if you create special caches for them, you can manage that more effectively and also account more effectively. You can uh, debug them without debugging all other uh, kinds of objects. So so for that, uh, there are also the KMM cache create alloc and free uh, as part of the slab allocator API. So uh, and uh, what you usually want from a good slab allocator is to a low mom is for it to have a low memory overhead, so you shouldn't occupy more memory than the sum of the objects that are actually allocated and used by somebody else, uh, of the user of the allocator. On the other hand, you want a good uh, or low CPU overhead and not wait on uh, shared logs that would induce latency. And it turns out that these two objectives go against one another. So to get the good scalability, you have to pay some extra memory overhead. And yeah, that's one of the uh, differences between the allocators we have today. And you also want nice debugging features because the, the allocator usually doesn't have bugs, but if somebody misuses it like allocates object and then freeze it twice. It can corrupt the, the slab allocators internal structures as well. And then it looks like a bug in the allocator, but in fact, it's a problem of the usage, but you want some features that will help you uh, debug these cases uh, uh, in a nice way and also detect buffer overruns and uh, stuff like that. So that's why these poisoning and red zoning features are for. So to, so, so to understand uh, how we got e into the today's state where we have three allocators, as I will explain, I duck a bit into the history of uh, kernel that even predates the, the git tree, but luckily there are archives uh, co that compile all the all releases 
into something that's also a Git tree, but not connected to the current one. Uh, one issue with them is that the, the individual commits are not as fine grade as, and documented as today. It's usually one commit per release. And there are uh, some comments provided for the whole release. I guess they will written by Linux, but like in retrospective. So for example, the very first implementation was lib malloc C in, in very early in 1991 by Ted So, which was also when he started contributing according to the, to the commit log. And it says that, yeah, it was the basic implementation of the equivalent of malloc and free and it made the mm, design decision that that to free the object you also have to pass the size of it and not just the starting pointer because it didn't keep the sizes internally and uh, so it appears there have been this free as uh, call that provided the size and it got years of uh, trying to get rid of it so the, i'm glad uh, we are not there any uh, anymore. So then something called KMLOC C was implemented two years later, which had the design decision that the size was prepended before the allocated object, so free uh, no longer needed these two parameters. Then in 1997, we got uh, one of the allocators that are still there today, the slab C. And uh, it was using, it was implementing uh, something that was documented in a book or uh, academic paper, which uh, was, as I was saying, making the observation that if you have uh, many copies of the same type of object, it makes sense to manage them together in a cache uh, created just for this object because then you can manage them more efficiently. Everything is the same size. You no longer need to track uh, each allocation size and you can do more fancy stuff like having a constructor that will, uh, that will uh, save you from re uh, doing the new initialization and f uh, for each allocation if, uh, if the object you are freeing are, is already somehow clean up and looks like a new object, you can skip this uh, cleaning and new initialization. And uh, so that's why when the KMM, KMM cache alloc free and uh, create uh, calls were created and the first uh, users will actually uh, VM area struck, which is part of memory management, and struck sock for networking. Uh, there were also caches uh, created for the generic KMALOC and K3 uh, calls, but they were not used yet. They were used uh, still by the, uh, that was still handled by the uh, previous allocator in KMALOC C. But uh, just a few months later, this was unified and uh, the old KMLOC was deleted and uh, since then if you want some uh, some KMLOC allocation that you give just a size it will pick one of those caches that have the uh, closest size there, there, there may be some fragmentation and overhead but it's easier than uh, than doing it another way uh, there's a, there was a bit more evolution since then. That I guess is not so important. At some point, Numa Averness was added and is there since since then until today. Uh, what's uh, important is that in 2006 another allocator was added. That was again more similar to the original one that. That, that supported just KMALOC and K3 and was prepending the size to each object. And uh, the use case was that uh, some systems are too tiny to handle the overhead of the better allocators. So for them, we do the simple thing that 
groups everything together, even though, yeah, you, you pay the worst scalability, but it probably doesn't matter on some small device, which has just one CPU anyway. And finally, in 2007, we got the third implementation that still there from Christoph Lameter, which is doing something very similar to the slab uh, allocator, but uh, but uh, it has some different performance characteristics that I will explain briefly and also develop the best kind of uh, the debugging features that I mentioned. So, uh, and that was, I think, 2007, July. And in October 2007, it was already made the default, the new slab allocator with the U. And uh, <laughs> according to the commit description, the reasoning was, there are some reports that it is already a default, but that's not true. So let's make it for, uh, to be a default. So I, uh, I'm not sure that was the best way to do such a, uh, su such a the change, but that's how it happened. And we try to be much more careful today and do it after proper evaluation. Uh, yeah, for that, the SUSE kernel switched only uh, several years ago after we did some performance evaluation and decided yeah, that it's feasible because in, in the beginning, uh, the slop, sloop SLUB allocator wasn't a cr clear win in each situation, even though uh, it was its goal, but workloads differ. And so it's uh, not like easy comparison. And because, uh, uh, because there was no clear winner, there were also some efforts in the past to create something that would be so universal that it would be better than each of them too, uh, separately. But that kind of ended when Linus said he doesn't want YASA, which means yet another slab allocator. And uh, my work today is just a continu continuation of that because I'm trying to get us back uh, to the single one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, some features that were unique to one of them were also uh, ported to the other one, which creates uh, just more code churn, and that's why the, one of the reasons why I don't consider that ideal. So the summary is that today, or not long, not not uh, actually today, uh, we but until. Until last week, we had three allocators. So the slab, the, the, the first one that implements the separate caches, slop, which was intended for the smallest devices and made some sacrifices uh, for performance. Uh, wouldn't be such a burden to have, but uh, it prevents some nice API changes I will describe soon. And then we have the SLUB, which is the default is somehow the best and I hope that's the one we stick to. So just to make you a bit more informed what are the main differences between the slab and slab even though they basically do the same thing. It's about how they handle uh, caching of objects that are not uh, yet used. So for both the main unit they work with is a slab page uh, which is uh, which is taken from a page allocator it could be four kilobytes or larger and then it's just divided to the uh, equally sized chunk that are the allocated objects and one difference is that uh, slub uses the free objects content as a place to put a linked list that keeps track on, of where the free objects are on the slab page. Whereas uh, slab with the A1 has a separate array that basically does the similar thing, but th this is one difference, but I think it's not the, uh, the most important one. 
then uh, when you have this basic unit, the slab page that you divide to the object and give them out to the colors, you need to manage the slab pages, which is again done uh, similarly between these two allocators. So you consider each nomanode separately because usually you want to uh, allocate uh, a memory that's on the local node close to the, your CPU, so it makes sense to split it. So basically there are lists of these, uh, these slab pages to make it uh, more manageable. It, there are keep separately tracked the slab pages that are completely full because then you don't want to check them for free objects anymore when you allocate. Uh, most of them will be partially full, so they will be on the partial list. And if they are fully free, you may cache some of them on an extra free list until you realize you have too many and you should actually free the pages back to the back, uh, page allocator. And there's always a spin log that protects these, uh, these lists. And uh, so that's the basic scheme which wouldn't uh, scale uh, without extra stuff on modern monthly core PC, uh, CPUs and computers uh, because uh, there's this spin log that would have to be taken for each allocation and free to, uh, to protect uh, this list and the objects in there. So slab with the A, solve this by caching uh, the objects on a per CPU cache. So if, if, you, if you do an allocation and and the cache is the array cache is empty. It will uh, allocate multiple objects in a batch, and then for the allocation can very easily just take them from the from the per CPU array. If you are freeing, you free just by putting the pointer to the array until it becomes full, and then you in a batch again free it to the actual uh, slab pages, the, which means you amortize the loss uh, the cost of the locking and there are also some other uh, types of arrays that are uh, needed to work well with NUMA but it's not so important the details this is the uh, the main idea the per CPU uh, arrays uh, so when sl slab the U1 was created one of the stated reason was that uh, these arrays are occupying too much memory uh, and uh, so it has a large memory overhead. So Christoph Lameter instead did something else. He uh, put a, a slab page to the exclusive use of each CPU and only if uh, you cannot use this, only if it becomes full, you go to the shared list and take a new one and uh, then you don't need to cache anything outside of the slab pages there. All the objects are always tracked in the slab pages. And also uh, to avoid some, some uh, expensive locking, uh, the, the way it takes the objects from this per CPU caches uh, is by a CMP exchange double instruction uh, using this extra trans transaction ID uh, uh, value in the in the KMM cache CPU uh, structure because uh, the one problem with this that if you are allocating then you can then you have this per CPU slab which which might have some free objects and you can just take it from the free list. But if a CPU is freeing an object, uh, it's not guaranteed that it will actually uh, belong to the same slab page that's, that's private to the CPU. So the freeing is not cached as well, uh, as well as if it was a simple array. So you have to use these atomic CMP exchange double things, uh, the instructions to free uh, an object that belongs to another CPU so you uh, don't corrupt its free list and that's why uh, 
The allocation is very fast, that's local. The freeing is very fast if it's on the same CPU, even though there's some cost to the atomic uh, operation. But if you are freeing uh, uh, to another CPU or to a slab that's on a list, it suddenly can become more expensive because it, the, the cache line of the uh, of the KMM cache CPU will probably sit on another CPU, so the coherency protocol has to do some work, or you might end up uh, freeing to the list. And, and it's really uh, common that the allocations and freeings happen on different CPUs, so that's why uh, the SLUB allocator is not always a clear win. Yeah, I will repeat it. Or? Um, yeah, so my question is, uh, you said the slab pages are dedicated, but you're also saying that different CPUs can allocate and free from the same slab page, right? Yep. From the same slab, sorry. Uh, they are dedicated for allocations, but other CPUs can free into that. Yeah, so once those other CPUs free from it, now the free list of that CPU is pointing to the same slab, right? No, no, that's that's not done this way because that would be even more expensive if you had to take over the whole free list. Okay, so yeah, I, I guess I'm confused then. Like how the I thought the free list. So the free list pointer is per CPU, right? And it's one pointer that points to like one freed object on the slab. To the list. And so you can have a slab with multiple free lists that belong to different CPUs, right? Yeah, actually, the one that is allocating kind of privatizes the original free list of the slab page. And so there's no more free uh, objects there. Yeah, and, and and when other CPUs start freeing into that slab, they construct a new free list that's, that's part of the slab page. And so the slab is not, so strictly speaking, it's possible the slab is shared, but it's not really dedicated to one CPU. It, it, it can be shared when they free uh, together. So, because you, you mentioned they're dedicated, so. Yeah, they are dedicated for the allocation and uh, on, on the, only until you exhaust the original free list and then you have to do something else. It's quite complicated. I didn't want to explain every detail because I wouldn't be able to talk about anything else. But just to get the idea, one, one, is, one allocator uses the per CPU caches and there were the other ones, some rather complex things that avoids any extra arrays, but as its own downside as well. Yeah, because uh, as I said, when SLUB was introduced, it was, the argument was that without these arrays, the, 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 over, the memory overhead would be smaller. But it turns out that these days there are many CPUs uh, or CPU cores and so then they, that means they all have slab pages private to them and uh, suddenly SLUB is the one that, that occupies more memory and as I learned that's one of the issues for some of the people that were sticking to the SLAB until now. So, so, so that was the main differences, of course there are many others and now why why is it, uh, why don't I don't want to have uh, multiple implementations? Uh, yeah, because it's uh, uh, many extra lines of code that have to be maintained. Uh, because the allocators are quite similar, we actually have some common layer that, that, uh, that unifies some of the uh, common allocation but it means uh, it sits in another C file than the actual implementation, so there, there, there's an extra call from one C file to another that could have been inlined. 
if if it was uh, if there was not this, this common layer or or maybe if you have link time optimization this is not a problem because the other option would be to duplicate the code in both of them and that would that's not great as well uh, and because we have these three uh, implementations there are features that somehow involve the slab allocators and the implementers then have to decide oh do i re-implement it for each each of the implementation or uh, do i not care so for example memcg kmem support was implemented in both uh, the main allocators uh, kassan and kfans also and it means just that was extra work but some features like the preempt rt chose just the slub allocator and uh, that probably was much simpler mm. and, and the problem with slop is that uh, even if we say okay this is the special use case allocator it's very small we don't need to re-implement all these new features for that even even with that uh, it, it blocks a useful uh, API change that was requested at some point by XFS developers, for example, that would allow objects that are allocated from the KMEM uh, for a, from a specific KMEM cache to free with the common K3 uh, function that's most that's mainly intended for KMALOC, but the slab and slab allocators don't mind if it's used also for the uh, for the objects for the from the special caches yeah and the problem why this was a problem with slop is that uh, again it's the simplest allocator that packs all the uh, objects together in one page because the ultimate goal is to have as as little memory overhead as possible and it tracks free objects in some kind of lists but they have multiple sizes and uh, when a block is uh, uh, when, a, when a block is allocated via some uh, some uh, some specific cache which are emulated on top of slop they don't really uh, use separate pages then when we free the the object uh, uh, through the kmem cache free function we get the pointer to the cache and then we know how large this object is and uh, we can free it but for k3 uh, kmylock object we have to again prepend the size to it so don't we don't repeat the same mistake of needing the size parameter for freeing and uh, suddenly uh, if we allowed k3 to be used on the kmem KM, uh, cache alloc objects with slop it would mean the, the the header for the size is not there for these objects so uh, it would uh, probably corrupt the the, the allocator Yeah, last I'm wondering, like, why couldn't they store the size in the free payload itself? Like, because uh, I know th there's implementations that can do that. Because then you need to only point to the first free object, and then the payload already has the, the you know, you could store the, the size somewhere in the payload, and then go to the next, you know, that way you didn't have the header. But you deleted this already, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, so of course there are some ways to re-implement the, the slope so, so it wouldn't have this problem. If we did it the very, uh, very straightforward way, like, okay, so we prepend the header to all the objects, uh, then the problem would be that, that it would make uh, for an extra memory overhead which is even amplified by the facts that we have to guarantee some alignment for because potentially anything you allocate from kmalloc is can be uh, used in a dma and then you have to 
maintain the DMA granularity, which can be on some architectures like 128 bytes. And that just, it was attempted, but yeah, the result was that uh, everything was suddenly larger. And if the goal of the allocator is to be as small as possible, that that's not, uh, that's not really great. So yeah, as uh, Joel said, uh, there would be ways to re-implement it to smarter, but but at that point it was just, uh, why don't we delete slop? And it, it would be simple, does anyone care uh, still about the tiny systems? So when this was proposed like for serious last November after the plumbers conference, I, I did some research and uh, thought, yeah, it seems like nobody uses slop anymore because we don't have these device with just few megabytes. I checked what open VRT, uh, WRT does for the routers, which used to be one of the small devices. And it and turned out they switched to Sloop already and their target devices is 128 megabytes, which is just fine with Sloop. Uh, what I didn't realize is that they might be the def configs in the tree that say, oh, this kind of architecture is device should build with slop, but somebody uh, pointed it out and yeah, there were uh, some of them and most said, oh, this is fine. We will just switch to slop, uh, except one board with eight megabyte memory where the guy actually tried it and said, oh, this was booting before with slop, but now I'm running out of memory. So I was thinking how to solve this and uh, it seemed the easiest way would be to try to remove some some of the nice things from slab, the use slab, uh, like all the caching uh, and debugging, which means I know it will not scale anymore, but it doesn't matter for such tiny device. So I created a config slab tiny option which just modifies how slab is compiled. It's not another implementation, it's just uh, like a feature of the slab allocator. And this was enough to, uh, to solve this regression. So in 6.2, uh, uh, the, the, the slab tiny was introduced and the slab was deprecated. And because there were no issues reported since then, I went ahead and removed the slop in, in, in the current uh, RC. So, uh, so the 6.4 RC one is already with the slop removed. I even installed it on this laptop. So it's already presenting without slop. And what it means that we can now do this K-free uh, freeing and K-free RC freeing on the KMM cache allocs objects, which wasn't possible before if, uh, if you were uh, compiled with a slop. So that's, that's nice, but I would like to go one step further and uh, remove also the slab allocator because as I explained, it's, it's not the different from slope, it has less features. So will anybody care about that one? So this was also attempted in the past few times and uh, yeah, it, there was always one of the complainers was David Rientes from Google who said, yeah, we have this uh, degradation of net perf uh, when we try to switch from slab to slab. Um, at some point, uh, I also objected because we were still using it at SUSE, but it was not like a hard objection. We did evaluate that we can switch. And even in uh, 2021, uh, David still had the same reply. Uh, but uh, things change and SLAP gained uh, some uh, bulk allocation and freeing API or actually both of the allocators did, again, extra work. And uh, this was enough to make the workload intensive, uh, uh, workloads, the network intensive workloads happy enough, so they they are fine with using Sloop. 
And uh, so David uh, from Google had somebody to do some measurements, which he posted closely before the conference, and it was just mostly noise. You couldn't say that there's a, there's a strong uh, difference. But what, what came out was that there's, I think, 30% more, more memory overhead for SLUB. And even though it's not so much in absolute numbers, because usually your memory is not the, so much used by the kernel objects, it, it's a concern that we should look into. But he said it's not uh, going to block the removal uh, right now. So, so we had this session at LSFMM, and uh, now nobody objected there. So I'm going to propose it on the mailing list and see if anyone else still has objections that wasn't present in the room. And yeah, we are separately from that. We are looking, uh, going to look in what we can do with the uh, uh, with, with the memory overhead. And if uh, if somebody finds a regression that looks valid, we can look into how to change slab to accommodate it because that's better than having two separate implementations. So, and my hope is also that once uh, there's a single allocator, uh, we can try think of more improvements to the API because we no longer have to care about three implementations. So it turns out, uh, for example, that uh, there might be a use case to reintroduce again some object caches that Slab has, but maybe not for all caches, but only for users that need it. Mm, and that could be either for the performance reasons or there are users that would like to allocate in NMI context, which is something that's not possible today with Slab. So, for example, what BPF guys did, they implemented that their own allocator, and it would be great if if the MM could uh, part could provide everything, so people don't have to re-implement their own. Uh, another use case that came up would be pre-allocations for the maple tree which we, we, we sometimes uh, the operations need to pre-allocate some nodes in case the tree gets more complex during the operation. And uh, we can do that maybe with a smarter way than just taking objects from the allocator and giving it back. If they were somehow still part of the allocator, that would be uh, more effective. I thought there was already a way to do that with KVM cache, like to pre-allocate, and then it gets it from like it was called KVM pool or something like some something with the word pool in it. So you mean mempool? Yeah, yeah they exist, but uh, but I don't think they work when there can be multiple users. They can give you guarantee that you don't run out of your memory until you uh, or the objects until you finish your thing but I'm, I'm not sure they work well with uh, multiple parallel uh, such allocations because there's no thing like banker algorithm that would say oh i cannot give this one any more objects because then i could run out of them so and uh, from this part the uh, the, the the outcome from the LSFMM was yeah we should investigate uh, how to do this and actually Joel also brought another use case for this kind of caching because K3 RCU that might sleep that doesn't work with embedded RCU head has to create lists of uh, objects that will that will can only be freed after the RCU grace period passes, and they currently implement it uh, separately by some allocating pages that use an array of pointer. And again, if uh, the slab allocator could do that itself, it would be perhaps more effective. 
So that's all from me. Thank you. And if there are any more questions. Is there an extra mic? Is a config slub tiny something you would consider removing later on? Um, or is that, you think that's a permanent fixture? It's something we can consider, but it, I don't consider it urgent because it doesn't really add any more maintenance overhead. It just uh, put some pieces of code behind an if dev and the pieces of code are uh, still there anyway because they are also used in the debugging caches where you don't cannot use the, uh, the per CPU caching. I heard about, a lot about uh, performance improvement. Uh, we have another problem with uh, slab is for system stability uh, dimension. So when we run our production, sometimes we see slab it, uh, size is growing uh, pretty fast. It's close to the secure li limit. Then we were very uh, nervous. We don't know it will keep growing or uh, it will slow down. It's a bug or it's a uh, it's a uh, design, um, and uh, my question is um, how um, the slob, how how much we can trust the slob can slow down, uh, can manage the the memory correctly. And the second, is there any accounting tracing uh, mechanism we can we know who is uh, allocating the memory? And then we can do something like uh, terminate uh, the, the big consumer, something like that, to make the our system stable. Okay, so the uh, the case where just caches grow, it's usually a fault of the user of the uh, caches, and not a uh, not not the problem of the allocator. One way you can verify it is if you look at the slap info and. You check if, if if it's the large difference between used objects and allocated objects, and if it's not large, then the the, the memory usage comes from the user. And then for the cache, you can enable one of the debug config option that will uh, that will track the calling stacks of the allocators and freeing. You can do that only on uh, boot time, not later, because the so, but if you have a suspicion of such a workload, you can reboot the machine with this and then observe it. The, the, the overhead is not like critical and then you can fix that code, but, but, but killing the process and finding it, that, that's probably not possible. So I will tell <coughs> the reason why we remove slab, then slab is because the development, development has been focused on slop and if the memory footprint, memory, higher memory uses, uses this to the question, why not just turn slop into something like slab <laughs> and remove slab? Yeah, that, that, that's one uh, possibility. If, if the overhead is really due to the design, we can adjust the design to, to be more like slab, at least for caches that where we know that the, the, the problem is happening. But, but I don't think we should like switch the design completely to be like slab. Or, or maybe if somebody tries that and evaluates that, yeah, it's a clear winner no other workload uh, would regress then, sure. Okay. If, if it's okay, due to time. Um, so, a question, question <coughs> excuse me, related to the uh, config slot tiny option. It was put into place config slot, which was meant for normal size systems, right? So it's just to fix a regression there. Um, is it but the config slab tiny was really there to fix the regression for a non-MMU device for very low memory. Sorry, yeah. 
Okay. Um, is are there plans to move the conflict slab tiny and other optional pieces like maybe no caching at all for more deterministic systems? Like there might be a kernel wide flag for embedded or put it under no MMU so that it never shows up as a config option for like a server compile. Yeah, it's possible, but uh, it, then maybe somebody would complain. <laughs> so this this is the most generic way. Uh, it's, it's an extra config option. Linux hates them, but the default is N. So and so so if if it was default yes, that would be a hard no. Okay. We still have time. Uh, yes, with uh, tiny config, can we still use all that uh, sanitizers like KMM leak, uh, kernel Kassan? No, that's not compatible with those, I think. That... So we, if we enable tiny, we cannot debug uh, any memory issues, like most of memory issues. What I think this this Kassan itself is such a high memory overhead that you probably wouldn't be able to run it on such system that need the tiny slope. You said that in SUSE you switched from slab to slope and didn't see any significant regressions. And what was the set of tests that was? ran on the measurement. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was done by Mel Gorman using his MM tests, but I don't remember the exact configs, but I guess it was some representative set of stuff we know that the customers are usually running, so I would have to check with him. So I, I was gonna. Uh, I was thinking like, this might not work for many reasons, but the the, I was thinking the problem with the per CPU slab thing, right? So you mentioned that you can free objects into other slabs, and that your free list now points to those slabs. So in theory, if you had like a long enough free list pointing to other slabs, you really wouldn't need the per CPU one, strictly speaking, because you'll start at. You have you have a free list already, right? You can start allocating from that. So, you know, there there's some ways maybe we can. This is something like what you did with the tiny, right? the tiny slab, right? You're using the the common slabs and not having the per CPU one. So we can maybe have something dynamic where, if we don't need the per CPU one anymore, maybe we can re release those free objects and return it to the system. I don't know. Yeah, there are definitely many things that can be tried and I guess it will be best to discuss them offline because now we cannot imagine all, all the how, how, how the result would look like. But thanks for the suggestions. So am I blocking am I blocking somebody from trying the their laptop? When did the next session start? I have one question. So CXL DRAM is going to be a different, uh, be a system RAM with a different performance characteristics. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion what slab or uh, slope or locator need to know, like uh, from near or far memory or to avoid the probability issues. So I think I, I don't. Think slab will become concerned with with CXL memory because uh, it depends how how it ends up represented in the in the kernel. If if, if it becomes just another memory node which has a zone normal, then uh, then yeah, the kernel objects could be allocated there, and slab would just treat it as normal memory. But if it's a zone device only, then 
kernel allocations wouldn't even touch such device. So slap would be out of the uh, question even on such memory. But un until I can, until that thing is resolved, it would be too early to think about what slap should do differently. I guess we will, would have to try and see if there are any issues with the current implementation. Is it okay? Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you all and thanks for coming.